cannot be terminally online, brother. You will not be able to log on post means and log off. You will not be able to keep playing GTA and smoke weed in the morning because the revolution will not be digitised. There is an often alluded to dichotomy that you see a lot on the internet. This is the divide between class reductionist leftoids and shitlib idpol rainbow capitalists. One side thinks that identity doesn't matter, only class matters. The other side thinks that class doesn't matter, only identity. My injustice is more important than your injustice. I just need to fix my injustice and everything will be fine. This dichotomy is false, obviously. We can indeed walk and chew gum at the same time. The thing is, to my thinking, we don't even need to do that. We can do one thing that fixes both problems. If we do it right, and we fight for it together. But how, I hear you say? Socialism and prejudice are unrelated concepts. One is economic and the other is cultural, right? Marx and Lenin didn't include this in their grand vision. No, but if they hadn't been so selfish and died before the 1950s happened, they might have. Lefty YouTube likes to focus on systemic issues and systemic solutions, which is cool. But what they often leave out is the prejudice that still exists between individual people. This implies by omission that racists gonna racist, transphobes gonna transphobe, they are bad people and we shouldn't bother with them. But I'm a psych guy. Why people gonna people is kind of the whole thing. What I want to do with this video is explain a little piece of psychological theory and combine it with the political theory that lefties are so fond of to see how they fit together. Perhaps, if done right, systemic solutions can solve personal issues as well as systemic ones. The revolution will not be right back after a message from Big Pharma, Big Tech or Big Booba. You will not have to worry about being cancelled, having a hot take or posting cringe. The revolution will not go better with Q. The revolution will not be an op by the CIA. The revolution will give you agency. The revolution will not be digitised, will not be digitised, will not be memeified, will not be creamified. You can't just wait for the VOD, people. Because the revolution will be live. Be live. Be live. Be live. No doctor bills, but Whitey's on the moon. Ten years from now, I'll be paying still while Whitey's on the moon. You know. The word prejudice or prejudging comes from the Latin word prejudicium. In Roman times, however, this meant judging a person singular by their previous actions. That isn't what we mean by the word today, so the Latin is no longer relevant. And ironically, thank God for that, because frankly, fuck Latin. The only people who speak Latin today are Catholic priests and Oxbridge graduates, neither of whom should ever be trusted and frankly should be kept out of power in civil society. The dictionary definition of prejudice is also somewhat lacking. While it includes the common usage of the word, it only really applies to one part of it. The psychologist Gordon W. Alport explores the definition in detail in his classic book, The Nature of Prejudice. And while he never puts it in shorthand, he concludes that prejudice is a negative or positive emotional and cognitive judgment of an individual, group or thing, based on irrational attitudes and or warrantless beliefs. You ever meet that guy who hates on a band even though he hasn't heard any of their songs? That is a prejudicial attitude based on a warrantless belief. He is prejudging the music as bad based on little evidence but the fact that he believes all goths are trash. Prejudging itself, however, isn't always a negative opinion the all Jews are good with money meme to a neutral observer might sound like a compliment. Who doesn't want to be good with money, right? You may remember that meme as causing something of a kerfuffle in the 1940s, and it still holds the record as the most long-lived, pointlessly destructive memes even into the present day. Congratulations, well done, good job. It's a good example of how an objective positive, when applied irrationally to a group, can lead to serious problems in thinking. By calling the Jews good with money, you imply that this is not true of other groups and that the Jews are so good with money they can use it to their social advantage. Which, if you aren't Jewish, makes them... scary. While Allport draws clear distinctions between positive and negative prejudice, it's worth noting that the positive prejudice is not only a lot less common, but can be easily turned into a negative prejudice with the right chain of dumb shit logic stringing it together. 
So with that in mind, this is the definition we'll be using going forward. It's also worth noting the difference here between prejudice and discrimination. Prejudice is internal beliefs and thoughts. Discrimination is the external behavior that follows. And oh yes, external behavior always follows. Gordon W. Alport, or GWA for short, separated these external outcomes of prejudice into a five-tier system of increasing badness, largely based on studies by the UN following World War II. Tier 1. Antilocution. Put simply, this is just words, but shitty words. Words that denigrate people. In the old-timey days, this was a lot more obvious. Slurs were spoken openly, and people expressed prejudiced opinions to their friends without any fear of judgement at all. Nowadays, in the era of mass communication, phone cameras, and social pressure not to be a dick, open antilocution is far more rare, but it is still present. I once had a co-worker in disabled care turn to me on my first day of the job and say, You know, I think you'll be a hard-working member of this team. Oh, well, thank you. That, that means a lot. You know why? Because you're British. Oh, well, I don't think that's why. I've worked with loads of immigrants, and they all work pretty hard. Some of them worked even harder than me, and yeah, all right, whatever. Needless to say, we did not have the best working relationship going forward. As I said, it's rare to hear outbursts like this. Most antilocution these days is done by implication rather than statement, or just dog whistle to the point that new words have to be invented to accommodate these idiots' fear of anyone who was in them. Postmodern neo-Marxist. Fear is very much present in all of these things, as you will see. Tier 2. Avoidance. Avoidance is pretty self-explanatory, really. The prejudiced person actively avoids contact with the target group wherever possible. Being around the group makes them actively uncomfortable, so they avoid going to places where they might encounter them. The best example for me is the homeless. A lot of people do whatever they can to avoid interacting with the homeless in any way, even if it's inconvenient or actively hurts them to do. A rich person might cross the street in busy traffic to get on the other side of a homeless guy, or take the long way home to avoid the tent city that just popped up. This demonstrates a higher level of fear and anxiety than Tier 1, but the person is not yet sufficiently scared to cause them to act on it publicly. He takes the burden of prejudice onto himself. Tier 3. Discrimination. This is where someone doesn't put the burden on themselves and instead decides to actively take their emotional grievances out on the group in question. This can include a lot of things, from just shouting at people in the street to direct action designed to scare or suppress. Going back to the homeless example, petitioning the local government to ban rough sleeping would be an act of discrimination. If the government agrees to it, it becomes systemic or institutional discrimination. If it doesn't agree, but the community decides to do it anyway, it's called social discrimination. Follow? Systemic discrimination can be both direct, like Jim Crow laws, or indirect, like the colorblind voter ID laws of today. While the last two tiers can be largely defined by intent, discrimination and the tiers above it are different. They have direct material consequences, regardless of intent. What matters is the harm done and that it happens to one group more than the other. Tier 4. Physical violence. Lynchings, shootings, the night of broken glass. This is Tier 4. Violence against the target group is now not only happening, but the perpetrators usually believe they're in the morally right position. Due to their own fears being so out of control that they feel attacked and threatened by the group's mere existence so attacked that they can justify and normalize the use of violence. Aggression is always a response to threat. You can throw the culture of policing up at this level. From what I can gather, police training has spent a lot of time scaring the shit out of potential officers, telling them to shoot first and ask questions later. This fear, combined with a negative attitude that is already held by the senior police, is what causes this seemingly endless supply of so-called bad apples just waiting to fall on your head, if you're black. The problems with the police are well known at this point. It's bad out there. It's really bad. Could it get any worse? Well, yes. Tier 5. Extermination. This is when the actions of one group against another goes beyond just oppression and into deliberate, intentional extermination or forced removal of people. I could list the examples here, so I will. That was a short list. A greatest misses, if you will. The difference between physical violence and extermination may seem like not so much to those who are currently being brutalized, but there is a difference. That difference is in intent. When I visited Auschwitz a few years ago, the thing that struck me most was the scale of it all. Photos don't capture what it's like standing at the gates of Birkenau. You can't see the outer walls. The camp extends further than you can see. That violence was more than systemic, 
It was industrial, an industrial complex of cold, dispassionate murder. Once a person reaches this level of prejudice, it's usually too late to dissuade them. They believe that the only way to solve the problem of another group existing, which is a dire existential threat to them, is to eliminate all of them in any way possible. If enough people get this far, you get the Third Reich, which speaks for itself. Discrimination is around everywhere, between all types of groups at different levels of the tier list, but they all stem from the same thing, prejudice itself. The false belief that one group is inherently better than the other, and the superior attitude that comes along with it. But surely in modern enlightened times such a thing would have no staying power, right? <laughs> You're right, it shouldn't. But yet it persists anyway. It even persists against the very logic of capitalism. That's right, it overpowers our desire to make a living sometimes. How do we get stuck with this brain parasite? Well, let's have a look at that. They'll make a one of us. We accept a one of us. We accept a In order to ascertain why human beings learn prejudice attitudes, we must first understand how we learn attitudes in the first place. Prejudice, like a lot of things, comes from a process called socialization. Socialization is a lifelong process of learning about the society in which you live, adapting to and internalizing what is considered by that society to be normal. How this typically works is that as a small child, you create a normal in your head by interacting and engaging with others and judging your own behaviors by their reactions to it. You learn the social norms and build your own frame of reference of normal and abnormal based on them. If I was socialized in a society in which taking a massive dump on someone's doormat was a sign of admiration and respect, I would do it more often, right? And I'd want to do it to Boris Johnson a lot less. This internalized idea of normal can be updated and rewritten as you grow up, naturally. It's a feedback loop of social information and social behavior. But because humans don't know everything all of the time, sometimes that normal can be pretty different from person to person and culture to culture. If you grew up in the 1950s Midwestern American landscape and someone in your community was outed as gay, the shocked pearl clutching of the adults tells the child watching that being gay is something to be shocked by and pearl clutch over. This is how prejudice passes from generation to generation. We see how society treats X, so we judge its goodness or badness based on that and rationalize it as we get older. Sometimes new information makes us rethink our assessment of X, sometimes we succumb to confirmation biases and believe only information that agrees with what we think already. When it comes to social relations, this learned normativity has an emotional root in what we find familiar and safe. Because of that, it arouses strong emotions when threatened by the spookiness of change. This is how in-groups and out-groups first form, around familiarity. We grow up with a group of people, usually a family, a peer group, a sports team, whatever. What we grow up with and what we get used to become our in-group, and we learn what that means through socialization. When we come across something we don't understand, we subconsciously categorize it as either in-group or out-group, and how we treat this new unknown is then influenced by traits we already associate with whatever category it fits best. Later in life, the formation of in-groups can occur through social connection to others around shared activities or even shared ideas and philosophies. But socialization, throwing ourselves at society and seeing where we stick, is at the core of it all. Forming an in-group not only affects what you believe about others, but also what you believe about yourself. It becomes a part of your identity almost automatically. This by itself is not a bad thing. If my in-group is humanity and I believe that humans have rights to life, liberty and happiness, no one's going to get hurt by that. Except aliens, maybe. Where we run into problems is that the more people become emotionally invested in their in-group, the more they rely on that membership to an in-group to define themselves, the more prone people are to hostility towards others. Neo-Nazis, for example, put a lot of emphasis on the importance of having low menelin levels and assign a lot of positive sounding things to the in-group, even when they could easily apply to anybody. To be white is to be a striver, a crusader, an explorer and a conqueror. By doing this, they exclude all other groups of people, people who aren't Nazis basically, from the very possibility of having those traits, making the out-group by logical means inherently inferior. It's not just that many are genuinely stupid. Indeed, one wonders if these people are people at all. Quod erat demonstrandum, libcucks, being white so gosh darn brill. Another irritatingly relevant example is TERFs. It's no secret the most hostile TERFs are usually the most radical feminists by their own admission. The ones who put more emotional importance and base more of their identity on being a woman 
are the ones fighting hardest to keep their category protected from outside change. And Graham Linehan, for some reason. Can't think why. This is an interesting thing to note, and a cautionary tale for all of us in-group havers, including us lefties. If you have so little going on in your life that your membership to the in-group of lefty is all that sustains you, it can lead to some very stupid thinking and stupid behaviour. You might even become a tanky. So while saying eat the rich is good and based and all that, try and keep your head on straight. They probably don't taste that great, and it's not being rich that makes you evil. It's about how you got rich in the first place. So is forming in-groups the problem here? If everyone just stopped valuing the in-groups as much, would racism be over? Eh, not exactly. One of the things Allport takes care to mention in his book is that forming an in-group that excludes others does not have to mean hostility. Strong attachment to your identity as a woman does not require you to exclude trans women. Strongly caring about being a member of the rugby team does not require you to gulag the cricket team. Plenty of in-group, out-group relationships exist out there in society and cause no harm at all. So where then does the hostility come from? So if in-groups are what we are familiar with, then out-groups are the unfamiliar, the unknowable. It is in this land of the unknowable that prejudice is formed. It's a two-part construct, essentially. It contains vague emotional attitudes and bullshit rationalizations, I mean, uh, negative beliefs, towards whatever group is in the firing range. We already mentioned a lot of the attitude part, whether the thing is good or the thing is bad. That's learned through socialization. But the attitude is merely the emotional response. In bigoted people, that emotion is usually fear. Aggression is a response to threat, tap the sign. But in order for the attitude to become actively hostile instead of just the usual wariness that comes from interacting with a neutral unknown, the mind must have a justification. This is why beliefs about particular groups what drive, maintain, and justify the hostility and shitty behavior of bigoted people. If an attitude towards a group is how you feel about something, the beliefs are what you think that you know about something. The problem here is that most of the time we don't know about the other group. That's why they're the other group. What we know and what we're familiar with is safely stored in our little in-group box. Actually knowing things about different groups requires effort and intellectual honesty, which most people aren't really willing to give up the time for. So they cheat. Alport called this the role of rumour. The way it works if you've never met a person from, say, Java, and some guy at a bar once told you, Fucking Javanese. They're all cow fuckers. I went there once and I saw them all lined up to take turns on this cow's tits like they were queuing for a fucking bus. This piece of information is now all you have about Java, its people and its culture. One anecdote from one guy who was probably lying and was actually just witnessing a cow being milked. But if you then heard that Javanese farmers were moving in next door, it'll be impossible not to at least think of that conversation. It's all that's filed in your head under Javanese people. What else can you think about? This process and action can be seen very clearly today with social media and Facebook in particular. Whether it be Jewish space lasers or the Great Replacement or LGBT as a government op to destroy traditional families, rumours have way more power than they rightly should, and they spread fast, no matter how ridiculous they are. If these rumours are the first thing you learn about a group, it can really colour your thinking until it's proven wrong. If it's about a group you already have negative attitudes towards and put a lot of time into disliking, the rumour becomes as solid as fact. At least to you. This of course isn't just spread by social media, it can be spread by comedy and stuff like that as well. If you know nothing about a group of people but all you know about them is the edgy jokes at their expense, the positive catharsis of laughing, combined with ignorance, fills that gap in your knowledge and makes the point of the joke stick harder in your mind. Why else did the attack helicopter meme become so big and last as long as it did? Because it's an absurd straw man that makes idiots laugh and reaffirms to them that trans people are lesser than us normal people. Two birds, one stone. The power of rumour, especially in local communities, can be very strong and even deadly. The lot of black men were lynched for rumoured crimes, usually without a trial and with no consequences to the murderers. On a cultural scale, the rumours can then coalesce into stereotypes, categorical traits that influence our opinion over a group, without any evidence or information. Why do our brains do this? Because they're lazy, and when given the opportunity take shortcuts to save thinking power, rather than seeking to understand each category in a more complete way. This is shown by studies of social interaction between all kinds of strangers. 
If people expect to spend a lot of time together, they make more of an effort to get to know each other. If they don't, then the brain doesn't bother looking for answers. When interacting with a marginalized group that we know little about, our assumptions about that group will fill the gaps in our knowledge with whatever bullshit is lying around. And if we're not putting the effort in, we act according to that bullshit. And believe me, it is bullshit. Statistically, a lot of the stereotypes held about certain nationalities and groups are not any more present in that group than any other. A lot of them are just kind of made up. Even if counter-evidence presents itself, a lot of the time primacy bias, or the tendency to believe what you learned first, can override it. No one likes being wrong, after all. The persistence of prejudice also depends on how easy it is to spot traits that identify a target as a member of a group. In the post-9-11 years, it was easy to select from the crowd who was to blame for 9-11. Anyone who had brown skin or was from a particular part of the world got labelled as Muslim by bigoted idiots all of the time even if they were Hindus or Sikhs. Because the visibility of the trait is so high, and racists had a strong fear response due to the stereotype of Muslims being violent, hate crimes against brown people went up across the board, not just for Muslims. Whereas lighter-skinned Muslims were often overlooked and presumed not to be Muslim until they said otherwise. Prejudice is kind of a habit after a while. It's a pattern of low-effort thinking about other groups. A person who hates and holds negative beliefs about one group is also likely to do the same to other groups in the future. They train themselves to accept negative assumptions more readily and spend even less time searching for new information. It's how conservatives slip so easily from the I don't like all these immigrants to The Jews did it somehow. So yeah, prejudice is bad. Thanks, mate. We got it. How do we fix it then? As it turns out, GWA figured that stuff out for us, and we've known for decades. Based on all the research he had available at the time, GWA presented an idea that would later be totally forgotten by the public, but can be conceptually found in the ideas of civil rights leaders, up to and including MLK himself. Yep, MLK wasn't just based, he was research-based. This idea was called the contact hypothesis. The basic idea was that no group could overcome its prejudices if it was separated from the other groups, as they very much were in the 1950s America when he wrote it. To overcome personal feelings and debunk the negative beliefs, groups must mix and interact with each other. But, I hear the self-critical voice in my head cry, the Deep South had contact between groups all the time, even before the end of slavery. So why didn't they just stop being racist, bro? Well, bro, GWA acknowledged this. Not all contact is created equal. So using his big science brain and a lot of previous research, he came up with what he called ideal conditions for the kind of contact that ends prejudice rather than exacerbates it. Number one, equal status. If you meet someone from an out group, your interaction with them and how it affects your prejudice will depend on what kind of interaction it is. A boss might hire a trans employee, for example, but due to the difference in power between boss and employee, boss has a far easier time of thinking of the employee as the other. If the employee being trans makes the boss uncomfortable, they have more power to act on that emotion, as well as the unspoken obligation to keep employees under control. If you are both employees of the same boss, and only one of you is trans, prejudice can be reduced if you both get treated the same and have equal interactions with no power to dictate to each other. It's actually harmful to you to be prejudiced against someone when you have to spend time working with someone as equals. The equals part is the point I'm getting at. If there is a power differential between you and someone else, it's really hard to fully trust what their intentions are, limiting the effectiveness of your communication. Equal status is the essential lubricant to cooperation. Speaking of... Two, cooperation. It's not just about spending time together at work, occasionally chatting on breaks before being forced back into the wagey cagey. If you work with someone cooperatively on the same project, your work relies on their work and vice versa. This team-based cooperation is how a lot of workplaces operate already. However, GWA asserts that this is just a part of it. The environment also has to be non-competitive. A telesales guy who's having a hard time making sales might look over at this trans colleague doing well and allow previously held prejudices to resurface as envy and affect his judgment of them. The Tulsa bombing in 1921 targeted a set of black-owned institutions colloquially known as Black Wall Street largely because the white population were afraid of the competition from the separate but equal parts of the population. So if competition is the wedge driving people apart, how do we persuade them to come together? Cooperation, obviously. But cooperation towards what? Three, common goals. 
If one group wants one thing, and one group wants a separate, antithetical thing, those groups are going to be rooting for the other to fail. This is like a fertile womb for prejudices and bias to grow in. This aspect of the hypothesis can be seen in sports teams. When they play against each other, the fans jeer and boo and occasionally riot. When the World Cup rolls around though, we see people of all in-groups come together to support the goal of seeing the larger in-group prevail, until the players take the knee or miss a penalty and suddenly the whole thing falls apart. The common goal is no longer there, so the old prejudice comes back with a vengeance. Or you could take a look at political parties in the UK. The reason Labour is always at the Tories' throats is that their goals are completely anti... Oh wait. The old adage that people come together when there is a larger enemy to fight is somewhat true it seems, but GWA posits that outgroup hostility is not all that drives this. What drives this is the common goal, and relying on each other to achieve it, whether it be victory or survival. GWA draws from previous writers and proclaims that while a tangible enemy makes the bond more salient, mankind could also bond around the common goals of ending poverty or, in the modern world, fighting climate change. Just a thought. 4. The lack of outside pressures and institutional support. GWA wrote this hypothesis during the Jim Crow era, where the outside pressures could be summed up as segregation laws, essentially, which can be, and were, protested against until they change. This might seem like it ended institutional prejudice, but let's face it, it didn't. While the racist laws may be gone from the books, the power structures in society simply found ways to rewrite the rules in a way that was colour-blind but still has the same outcome, discouraging equal contact rather than encouraging it. Round these parts, we don't police black neighbourhoods, we police the places where the crime happens. They just happen to be black. See? We're not racist. This sentence, of course, ignores the fact that crime is driven by poverty and that a lot of black people have been forced into a poverty trap due to decades of legally enforced exclusion, but yeah, sure Jan. The media institutions also play a role here. A lot of the news around BLM protests focused heavily on the riots and the chaos. Tying BLM to that imagery is a more subtle enforcement of the idea that black rights and by extension black people are dangerous. In the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of lip service in the media to anti-racism, and that's a start. But as long as the media builds its business model out of fear, especially fear of out-groups, the in-group will remain prejudice. So this is a cool hypothesis, right? For the 50s, it's downright revolutionary. But as science nerds, we can't just accept that it's true without proper testing, right? So how's that going? The contact hypothesis is supported by a lot of research. It's been over 60 years, and a lot of people have had a crack at it in that time, testing specific parts of it and refining it by quite a bit. Brewer and Kramer in 1985 found that equal status interactions reduce prejudice, but was super effective when status between groups is equal before and during the interactions. Aronson's jigsaw technique found that rearranging classrooms and having different groups work collaboratively reduced classroom prejudice significantly and was reproduced all over the world to similar results. Who and Griffey found that mixed race sports teams had less prejudice due to both striving for victory together and relying on each other to get the win. Landis and a whole bunch of other people found that military personnel became much less prejudiced when integration became official state policy and working together was encouraged. Thomas Pettigrew and his various associates spent decades testing the fine details of the contact hypothesis and came up with methods and approaches to help generalise people's lack of prejudice in personal life to lack of prejudice towards groups as a whole. Pettigrew also did various meta-analyses and found that combating the emotions behind prejudice, like fear and lack of empathy, was more effective than combating the bad beliefs with information, although both approaches still worked. More proof of it were needed that prejudiced people just get their fifis hurt when they see a trans woman being treated as who she is. Nike contends that women are sorely put upon in the United States. It is simple pandering. People like to be told that they are a victim of American society. Most people in the United States are not victims of American society. There is no logical deduction, only post hoc rationalizations for being a massive wimpy baby about things. So this is all very impressive and robust, Mr. Science Man. But how does this relate to the Corbynista hard left snowflakery you call socialism? How will taking the sweat from the rich man's brow stop people from hating on the gays? Hmm, a hundred gazillion dead woos ever greatly forward. Well, first off, smarmy contrarian voice that lives in my head along with the others, let's take a look at the core ideas of socialism and see if we can spot any patterns. I don't need a rationale 
to sing the international. <laughs> this is the part that will probably get the online left mad at me. Whoopee. You know the drill. Ask 10 leftists to find socialism, and you won't get 11 answers. You won't even get one. Usually, you get endless, pointless infighting about what some very smart, very bearded, but mostly very dead people wrote in the 1800s or did in the 20th century to, shall we say, mixed results? Frankly, fuck that. We are the new generation. It's up to us to decide what our socialism looks like or does. And shooting down a good idea because commie Jesus didn't explicitly say it is the behavior of televangelists, not rational people. To me, socialism is a practical attempt to realize a utilitarian ideal of the greatest happiness for the greatest number. The three most core ideas are social or public control of the means of producing goods and services, decommodification of essential goods and services to ensure universal availability, destroying or flattening unjust hierarchies so that no man may limit the freedom of another unless that man himself is threatening the freedom of another. Yeah, I nicked that from the anarchists, but to me it's important. Pretty simple, right? Shame it hasn't really happened anywhere. yet. Now, liberals might argue that socialism is unnecessary to eradicate prejudice. Why not just have a social democracy with strong unions and a welfare state? The state can make laws to prevent discrimination. Can't we get rid of racism that way? Well, possibly. But if we accept the contact hypothesis I just laid out, we find a few snags. For one, keeping capitalism in place, an ideology based entirely on competition, doesn't really encourage the whole working cooperatively to achieve common goals thing. Capitalism insists that competition is essential for driving innovation and success. Which I've never really understood. Tesla was never going to profit from his inventions, but that didn't stop him from inventing a way to distribute power to the masses for free. Edison and patent law did. Also, we have a lot of historical evidence that social democracy does not end in group outgroup hostility. A long time ago, in the far-flung island nation of the United Kingdom, our welfare state and strong unions did little to end the prejudice underlying everything in British people. And social democracy is a fragile thing. <laughs> unions can be, and were, divided and conquered with racist scapegoating. The welfare state is an easy target for demagogues and the media to stoke fear of the other, getting more from it than you do. When neoliberalism happened in the 1980s, it was accompanied by a resurgence in the support of far-right groups, racial violence, and overall social unrest, especially distrust of the poor. An unrest that never really went away, and later found a political home in the push for austerity and Brexit. Even the social democracies of Europe today are combating prejudice in a... an air eh way, pretty much. It's clear that these current systems do not create ideal conditions for the contact hypothesis to work. But before the tankies watching get all smug, let's not forget that the Soviet Union and modern China were and are full of prejudice. Only instead of it coming from competition amongst the masses, encouraged by the sensationalist for-profit media, it's rigidly enforced by the state instead. To gulag-level results. So no, Stalin did nothing wrong for 2069. This is not a price worth paying for the glorious revolution. The means and methods of revolution dictate its end results. So a revolution that ignores prejudice between groups will not create a society that addresses those problems. If that means a redesign of socialism, so be it. I will try In order to achieve our goal of eliminating intergroup prejudice, we need those three things, the three core tenets of leftist libertarian thinking. How do they map onto the contact hypothesis, you ask? Well, let's get the details down first. Social control of the means of production. Most Western representative democracies have three elements in them that dictate the power structures. Businesses, the workers, and the state. These three elements influence each other in different ways. The balance of power is rarely equal, but each still requires that the other exist. The Marxist-Leninist route, at least in practice, is for the workers to rise up and take over the state, and use state power to control the economy, bringing businesses to heal with laws. While you could hypothetically legislate the discrimination out of existence, the prejudice underlying it would still be there. In order to create the ideal conditions to eliminate prejudice, I feel the best solution is for the workers to seize the means of production from the businesses directly, by establishing democratic worker co-ops and flattening the hierarchy inside the workplace. A democratic workplace where everyone has a say in how things are run, managers are elected rather than selected, and the goals and aims of the business are voted on by everyone, could do a lot to create the ideal conditions. More people are of equal status, and the power differential between boss and employee is significantly reduced. 
It may not be perfect, but over time, the presence of democracy would change the organization's culture. Leaders will be chosen by their ability to encourage cooperation within the workforce, rather than competing for management jobs between themselves. Prejudiced people do not make for those sorts of leaders. Even if the workforce is not very diverse, it at least gives the minority workers more of a say and a chance to persuade the majority to see things how they do. Open dialogue under equal conditions is the key element here. It also alters the relationship between the workers and the state. While we currently have a universal right to vote, governing bodies can limit our impact that has, be it with ID laws, first-past-the-post systems or anti-protest laws. Big corporations, on the other hand, can, and very much do, influence the state a lot more, using donations, lobbying, think tanks, and networking. By seizing control of the means of donation, worker-run companies can exert the same pressures on the state apparatus, making the state legislate according to what the population want, rather than the select few at the top. So while this will encourage the ideal conditions inside the workplace, what about outside of work? 2. Decommodification Decommodification means taking a good or service and making it free for everyone. That's pretty much it. Think of healthcare. Healthcare costs in a market system are often far too much for an individual to afford out of pocket, so you get an arcane, twisted insurance system that's focused on competing for profit rather than doing the best job possible. The solution? Split the bill. Among everybody. In the UK, everybody pays into the national insurance, and that in turn pays for the NHS. Simple, efficient, everyone gets fixed up for free, because we've already paid for it. This model can be used to fund basically anything, really. Housing, higher education, energy, the postal service, public transport, food distribution, even broadband. By taking these essential services and making them free at the point of use, we can address the current social inequalities between groups in these areas. The fact that people need so much money to survive is kind of the problem with intergenerational wealth being unequal. If intergenerational wealth is unequal between groups, and wealth determines where and how you can afford to live, then creating a large social housing program and providing free education that anyone can use will begin to undo the effects of historic segregation. Universal programs like this create a stronger sense of equal status as well, allowing for more positive contact between groups out of wider society, not just at work. It might cost a lot up front, but over time these policies have generally been shown to pay for themselves as social benefits, and they might fix bigotry too. Bonus! 3. Flatten the hierarchy A key point of the contact hypothesis is that the contact between groups must be equal, outside of a hierarchy. This is because power over another individual brings with it a sense of obligation to command or obey, discouraging honest dialogue and preventing trust from even happening. Seizing the means of production from big business flattens one hierarchy, but leaves the hierarchy of the state intact for the most part. To flatten this, we need to use our combined power to push for changes in how the state operates. Removing first past the post would mean that every vote matters more and prevent two-party rule from entrenching itself. Making voting easier would flatten the party hierarchy even more. Moving from representative democracy to a more direct approach can also flatten the hierarchy by reducing the role of politicians from decision makers to administrators, whose actions are detected by all of us rather than the lobbyists whispering in their ears and lining their pockets. If we would speculate, we could even imagine that over time, the dramatic reduction of inequality would remove the social pressures that push people to form most of their bad outgroup beliefs in the first place. The counter to bad information is often just more information. The more people you meet, the more you know about people. If the attitude that we are all equal human beings that deserve a good standard of living becomes widespread enough, we could eliminate the socialization cycle that perpetuates the prejudice of the status quo. Maybe, just maybe, we can do away with such shallow thinking altogether and unite behind common universal goals rather than vague in-groups. In-groups that only serve to make us weak, angry, irrational, and politically ineffectual. Maybe. To a lot of people, these ideas will come across as pipe dreamy, utopian, unrealistic, or just too hard to reasonably achieve in our lifetime. Maybe that's true. A lot of people are just too busy fighting and scraping to get by to really think about the future or, or the possibility of radical change. But it sure isn't because we don't know how. We've known for a long time what the problems are and how to fix them. It's a lack of collective will, not collective wisdom. Before you start to despair, however, 
Let me go back to Pettigrew's three-stage model for ending prejudice I alluded to earlier. Stage one is decategorization, promoting the individual, the idea that black, white, gay, trans, or whatever, we are all just people. This stage has already happened. It's common knowledge now that judging people by immutable characteristics is stupid. It's why the right goes to such lengths to try and prove that wrong, with laughable fake science and emotive punditry. Stage two is salience, making group inequalities more visible and well known. This is happening right now. Movements like BLM and the explosion in visibility for trans people are making the issues that face these communities more and more common knowledge. It's time for all of us to stop looking away from these problems, face them, and decide together how we're going to solve them. The arc of history is long, and it must be bent towards justice. Step three is recategorization, the rebuilding of our group identity, the end of us and them, and the beginning of the we. This, sadly, remains in our future. We have not yet unified under one identity, be it class, culture, or species. I wouldn't even begin to know what that identity is, or even what it should be. But if the contact hypothesis holds true, the only way we can achieve anything at all is by fighting together for the same common good. As long as liberals keep ignoring class prejudice, social prejudice will continue. And as long as lefties keep ignoring social prejudice, class prejudice will continue. The truth is, we need to work together if we're going to win any of this. There is a lot of common good to fight for these days, and we won't get anything we want without getting each other's backs first. While online discourse can feel huge, divisive, and emotionally draining at times, it's worth remembering that on the other end of your phone is a person, just like you, a person who worries about money, who is talked down to by authority because of who they are, who is exploited by their boss, and who has been a victim of prejudice themselves in their own way. Not all of us will change the world, but all of us can change our local communities for the better. So be you lib or be you commie, if you want to make the world a better place, it's time to put away your prejudice towards the other guys and form a front that we can unite behind, building on the values we share rather than wasting time trying to be different from them. Because if we do, we'll be unstoppable. Just listen to their argument and see if it makes sense. Sometimes they'll be your ally, sometimes they'll say dumb shit, like everyone. Exactly. And that's why I think this exclusionary, this authoritarian in-group and out-group forming based around opinions that don't get to get challenged or engaged with is incredibly dangerous. It creates with one of the things I always say is um, I don't want my people or, or my movement that I associate with to which I consider the oppressed to just take on the weaknesses of our oppressors, which is divisiveness, which is racism, which is all the authoritarian. Hello everyone. I hope you enjoyed the video, it took a lot of work to put together, but it's worth it for the things I really care about. This video contained a lot of stuff that the algorithm monster hates, besides my usual naughty language, so if you want to share it around to people who might be interested or have something to say about it, please do. If you want to support the channel even further, please consider subscribing, and if you want to help me make more videos, throw a fiver at me on Patreon. If you wanted to add anything or think I missed something, leave a comment, yes I will see it. Sources and extra reading are in the description as always if you want to dive deeper. And uh, thanks everyone. See you soon.